Uh, thank you very much for all the participants, especially from other institutions, especially from your hospital. A big contingent has uh, joined us today, and we are. Uh, we are, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Adam Qureshi, our uh, younger brother from Pakistan, who is currently working as assistant professor at North Carolina University. He is basically trained from the University of California, Los Angeles, and has done his uh, fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology. Obviously, after doing his American board of ophthalmology. So, we are very blessed that he was visiting for a marriage ceremony. He was there for, to attend a marriage ceremony of his family, of family members. And Hassan has worked with him and is in touch with him uh, since he was also in UCLA. So, uh, Hassan suggested that we can hold a lecture. In just in these three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, since he is leaving after that. So we just grab the opportunity and try to bring him over to our department, and so many people will be benefited by his uh, lecture. And much more people, number of people will be benefited through the video recording being done by Dr. Kashi Jagi. And by the evening, this video will be on the YouTube with a link circulated through our WhatsApp groups all over the country. And uh, you, you be very happy to know that whatever we do on every Thursday is liked by so many people and is watched by so many people on the YouTube and they are regularly attending, seeing those videos and they request that this thing should not stop ever because we continue medical education by yehi zariya so when we are in our region even when we are in the world, we are in the world we are in the world, we are in the world we are in the world, we are in the world, we are in the world, we are in the world एकेडमिक एक्टिविटी नहीं होती तो हम उसी को देखते हैं कि अपने आप को रिफ्रेश करते हैं। तो यू नो दिस इज अ ग्रेट अपॉर्चुनिटी फॉर आस दैट आज़म इज़ हेयर विद आस एंड ही इज़ गोइंग टू गिव इस प्रेजेंटेशन। सेकंड थिंग इज़ दैट यू नो दैट हसान और रेजिडेंट और स्टूडेंट हमारा बच्चा प्यारा कुछ लोगों को सुनके वो मैं ही जानता हूँ तो मेरी इससे ये रिक्वेस्ट है कि एक छोटी सी सूरत हमें सुना दे ताकि वो तलावत वाले से जो स्किल्स हैं वो हम उनसे उस स्किल हो सकें और इस मैफिल में भी एक बरकत पड़ जाए और ज़्यादा इसमें सर आ जाएं पहले ना तो अभी हम सांस जो कि आज साथ में नहीं वो मुश्किल होगा
ہم نے آپ کو بے شمار خوبیاں عطا فرمائی ہیں بس اپنے رب کے لیے نماز پڑھے اور قربانی کرو بے شک جو آپ کا دشمن ہے وہی ہر خیر سے محروم ہے اور آپ کو تھوڑا سا یہ بھی انفارمیشن دے دیں کہ جمعہ رات کو جو ہم ہر ہفتے سیشن کرتے ہیں وہ سیکنڈ مئی کو لاسٹ سیشن ہوگا اس کے بعد رمضان شریف شروع ہو جائیں گے ہم نے اس سلسلے کو روکنے کی بجائے اس طرح سے ارینج کیا اور اس کے لیے میں شکر گزار ہوں ڈاکٹر نعیم خالد صاحب کا کہ ان کے دوست ہیں کلیگ ہیں جو سوسیٹ پروفیسر ہیں اسلامیہ پالیسی میں لائنز میں اسلامک اسٹڈیز کی ان سے ہم نے ریکویسٹ کی ہے کہ وہ ہر تھرسڈے کو اسی طرح صبح نو سے دس بجے تک درس قرآن دیں گے اور انہوں نے ہمیں ٹاپکس بھیجے ہیں جو بڑے ہی ریلیونٹ ٹاپکس ہیں پریکٹیکل اس میں باتیں ہیں کہ رمضان کا ہیلتھ سے کیا تعلق ہے رمضان سے کیا فائدے ہیں اس طرح کے ٹیکنیکل ٹاپکس ہیں وہ میں شیئر کروں گا آپ لوگوں کے ساتھ مختلف جو گروپس میں واٹس ایپ پہ تو وہ سلسلہ ہمارا نو سے دس تھرسڈے ٹو تھرسڈے اسی طرح چلتا رہے گا لیکن تھیم ظاہر چینج ہو جائے گی اور میرے خیال میں یہ ریفریشر کورسز ہمارے لیے بہت ضروری ہیں تاکہ ہم راہ راست پہ اور سراتے مستقیم پر
some basic questions such as is the patient if, if it's not an infant, is it Have they been on corticosteroids, radiation therapy? Um, uh, had they uh, had a history of a stem cell transplant or any type of leukemia? Because those patients use uh, steroids at some point in their life. So basically, you kind of just need to tease out a few of these things. Also, you need to ask some basic questions about trauma, uh, hypotrauma, and unilateral bell cat cataracts. And I'm sure most patients have that would tell you that without even asking. Um, uh, also, uh, for prognosis, you want to know the timing of the changes if uh, they were, if these were a cataract child format or if there's something that developed. And then lastly, uh, looking at photographs and kind of uh, looking at the red reflex of the photographs, you can, you can kind of assess uh, and through historical photographs, uh, you know, what the, what the status of the cataract was previously. Um, for, you know, exam, uh, you want to do uh, visual acuity. Um, in, in America, we mostly do uh, fix and follow uh, for the infants, and then we do optotypes for the older children. Um, uh, you know, and preferential looking is done more in England than uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but we don't do that as much in, uh, in America. Um, also look at uh, APDs, and then you want to do a handheld symptom exam and indirect ophthalmos indirect ophthalmoscopy and the uh, B-scan if you can't see in the back. Um, always a good idea uh, to, do, to assess the family members uh, as well, especially in the congenital cases, because you'll have a 35-year-old parent uh, with the patient, and they're sitting right there. Just have them come to the slip lamp for a second. Um, uh, I saw that we had a patient in uh, UCLA, and this patient, um, you know, we, uh, we we, uh, we were handing the cataract surgery, so, and our attending said, hey, have the mom come up, and we had the mom come up, and we found, sure enough, we found the cataract on uh, the mom. It wasn't central, it was, uh, it was paracentrally located. It wasn't causing visual significance, but it tells you, like, hey, this is, uh, this is a, a congenital disease for this uh, child. Uh, so uh, once you see a uh, cataract, you know, we have the differential diagnosis, which I'm sure all of us memorize for all of our exams. Um, you know, uh, what can uh, leukocoria be? And um, it's not always a cataract. So uh, you have to look at uh, the different things. And uh, oftentimes, if we ever have any leukocoria before we proceed with anything, we do an exam under anesthesia. And I'm sure that's done out here as well. And uh, we do uh, a full evaluation and we look for, you know, the most number one thing we have to rule out is retinoblastoma. And uh, but then the rest of these things also are causes. And, um, I, uh, and particularly, PFB uh, is very tough in the clinic sometimes to distinguish between a persistent fetal vasculature and, uh, uh, and uh, a congenital cataract, and uh, as a posterior polar cataract. So uh, that's something you know we look for. But in these, these are usually unilateral, uh, and um, uh, and there's usually can see some type of blood vessel. Um, uh, and yeah. So I'm just going to take you a few pictures of patients I've seen, or, and some are borrowed from books of uh, cataracts uh, that uh, you know, see. This is an anterior polar cataract. Sometimes these photos aren't as good, but when you kind of tilt the slit, you can kind of see these uh, a little bit better and more clearly where it lays on the lens. Uh, but this anterior polar cataract conservatively followed. This is a more significant anterior polar cataract. Um, and here is a lamellar cataract. These involve the anterior uh, cortical component, they spare the nucleus, and oftentimes, uh, oftentimes these uh, patients uh, do not require surgery. Uh, here's posterior lenticonus. Uh, this is quite... Go back to the picture. Yes. On that side, is the cataract just like this? Yes. Would you still be No, not surgical. Not surgical. Yeah, not So any... So this is what I'm going to give to this in my talk. Uh, you evaluate the patient. If um, uh, there's many patients I don't do surgery on now uh, because uh, the visual function is reasonable. Visual function is reasonable, and once you do the surgery, you cut out accommodation. And you're once you cut out accommodation and you lose that near ability, you're affecting the kid's binocularity uh, as they get older. You're affecting their stereo acuity. So we oftentimes that definitely was not uh, honestly even. Uh, I think my laser stopped working, but that's fine. Um, uh, e uh, even sometimes even that one. I would consider not doing that one because this is a that's paracentrally located. If the kid came in and they were seeing and I think had good signs of uh, good vision, the cataract surgery has a you know a little bit more risk than a benefit in some kids who have. Uh, so the important thing is to evaluate the visual functions very particularly. Very, very important. Visual acuity is is crucial in these in these kids. Even in these lamellar cataracts, oftentimes these kids these they, they don't require surgery. 
Um, and the number one thing you can do for any of those kids who are not doing surgery is you just schedule very regular follow-up. You schedule very regular follow-up, you're doing, you, you will catch any changes, you'll see any, anything, um, uh, you'll, you'll notice their vision and say, hey, their vision's not getting better. You can, uh, if it's unilateral, you can do patching, you can ask the family how they're, how they're uh, performing with patching. But the one instance where, you know, some of these categories we would consider doing something is if the family's unreliable, or you might never see the family again, and you're unsure of this, then, then, it's a, then that begins to question your management of, hey, should I, do I need to do surgery, or do I not need to perform surgery? Um, here's what's your life bonus. In, in America, we have a lot of these patients. And uh, these patients actually, sometimes the cataracts don't look as bad. They do like the one type of patient where the cataracts look less impressive, but they almost always require surgery. These patients uh, oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, they, their, their, vision, uh, their vision isn't good, or they're having strabismus or late nystagmus. And so they're having signs that are showing you that, hey, this patient needs surgery. And, uh, and so uh, a lot of patients, we do these, and then uh, the I'll be showing you a surgical video and the patient we're doing is a, uh, is a posterior lunge patient uh, at the end of this. And kind of how we manage it, how we manage the posterior capsule in these patients. Um, and then uh, obviously nuclear cataracts, these are the ones that are kind of always done because these are very central, very prominent, and pretty much uh, their, uh, their amblyopia causing amblyogenic um, cataracts. And then here's a posterior polar cataract. Um, uh, and these ones also usually typically uh, also uh, have some, uh, uh, have some uh, in causing uh, amblyopia. I have a patient who has one of these that I'm following. He's about, right now he's like 11 months old, and he's doing very well with patching. He came in with an exotropia, and then we found the posterior polar cataract that's paracentral. He's tolerating the patching, and so I'm waiting until after a year or so uh, to, to where I can uh, you know, know the ILL calculation of what I want to put in. Uh, because I'm seeing that he's doing pretty well right now uh, with the patching therapy. Um, so what's the etiology of the bilateral cataracts? That's kind of the next thing we'll look at. Uh, so about 50, um, we get an etiology of about 50% of patients. Um, the most common cause of the mosomal dominance or some type of mutation in the connections, the connections and crystallines of the, of the lens. Um, this is kind of like an exhaustive list. I'm not going to go through all this of the uh, uh, of all the different uh, types of uh, diseases that can uh, precipitate cataracts. Um, and it's kind of good to know the, uh, the not just the headings, and then you can kind of fill in your, fill in your mind of what the diseases are, like metabolic disorders, and, um, and craniofacial syndromes, and uh, like uh, outport and uh, low syndrome. These patients, uh, both of these tend to have a posterior blunticomus. Um, Trisomy 21 patients are very common in America, as I'm sure they are here. And we notice a lot of these patients have lamellar and cerulean cataracts. And um, uh, any of these patients with intrauterine infections uh, can have cataracts. Um, and these can become sometimes a presenting sign of intrauterine infection. Um, so it's very important when you see these patients, uh, uh, it's very important when you see these patients to, um, uh, to order some basic lab over what we typically order. Um, in the bilateral setting of a bilateral cataract. My Italian this should be these patients often have a Christmas tree cataract, um, which the pictures are quite uh, quite nice. I don't have one in my presentation, but they're quite nice. You can find them on uh, Google. Um, so this is kind of the basic labs of, of what we get uh, uh, for any patient that has a bilateral cataract. For the unilateral cataracts, we get no labs. We don't do it. We don't have to work it out. Um, but we get torch titers, VDRL, cerium, calcium, and phosphorus, urine for reducing substrates. And uh, uh, anything more than that, like if they have a craniofacial abnormality or, or if they're having diarrhea and we're worried about some special disease, um, we will get a, at that point, we'll consult the pediatrician to help us, uh, aid us in the, in the workup. Um, and sometimes we'll involve a geneticist if we're worried about problem and strike syndrome or, um, or any type of disease like that. Um, so, uh, so I'm not going to do a case that I, I did. So this is a this is this was a, a picture of a six month old in this, in this picture. But she is a uh, she is a, a four week old returned to uh, UCLA. Uh, she had a bilateral cataracts. She had a family history of cataracts um, uh, of congenital cataracts. No good fixation on the exam, but no nystagmus or this either. She was seen by a pediatrician, and you know just because her mom had it uh, and uh, several other members. 
had it, we knew we were going to be doing surgery. Um, so uh, you know, we did a uh, we did an ultrasound, and uh, so we decided to perform surgery on the left eye first. And that surgery on the left eye had no complication; it went very well. On the uh, on the right eye, uh, after the surgery, we had a, a, a complication of an elevated intraocular pressure, uh, intra uh, like postoperatively, and uh, so uh, you know. We, we thought, at first we thought, oh, she has glaucoma, uh, but then uh, we noticed, we know what we actually, what we actually realized was, was we had done the, uh, when we were doing the anterior vitrectomy for her, uh, basically some of the vitreous had come forward and was plugging the, was plugging the trabecular meshwork. So what we ended up doing was we took her back, we did a peripheral iridotomy, and we did a, a, another a repeat anterior vitrectomy again, and then her vision actually started to improve. But just because of that period she didn't have vision, we started doing her, uh, she started doing patching. Uh, we started patching the, uh, the good eye uh, because that period she had uh, no vision when we were uh, between surgeries. And um, so afterwards she did very well. There was a little bit of asymmetry in the size of the two eyes from that period where she had an elevated intraocular pressure. Uh, but typically in America we wait until uh, four weeks to do this, at least four weeks to do the uh, cataract surgery, because in four weeks, uh, before four weeks, there's some uh, literature that suggests that there's a, a risk of uh, increased risk of glaucoma. But then, obviously, you don't want to wait too long uh, to do the, uh, to do the cataract because then you're uh, causing deprivation and myopia. So, so she ended up doing very well. I'm still in touch with the, the family uh, about her. Here's her family tree. There's that's her grandfather. He had it. He was found on exam as well. Like. When they were examining his children and they found that the oldest son had it, they found his on uh, exam. I wasn't there for that, but my attending told me. They found his uh, on exam. And uh, uh, and then so we, this was, uh, our patient is down there where the arrow is. And then uh, her mom uh, was also my patient in, uh, in UCLA. She kind of came in and said I was seeing double. And so hers is, this is her over here. And this is my attending who did her surgery when she was a kid who also did her brother's. And uh, she actually did very well, except for in the surgery, the phaco equipment wasn't as good. And so what you can see there is she, has a, a, she had a, a iris tear. And it used to be very bad. So one surgeon in LA had, done, uh, sub, had tried to do a pupillopastic and did some proline stitches uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the iris, and he sutured in an ILL. And uh, so she was left a fake and she was a contact lens wearer through childhood. But she was left a fake uh, So she had poor vision. Um, and then after this, she noticed her vision improved, but she started having some double vision. And so when we saw her, we evaluated her and we said, hey, um, you know, maybe we can try to close the rest of your pupil uh, and see if that helps your double vision. <laughs> and so we closed her pupil. She still has some double vision. And so then we did a, a also had a right hypertrophia, so we did a left inferior rectus recession as well for her, and then her double vision was gone, and so now she has very good, uh, very good uh, uh, vision, and she's very happy. She's an artist. She did all these uh, patches over here uh, for her daughter, uh, so her daughter could uh, enjoy the patching, uh, and so she did well. So you know, even if you feel like some of these surgeries, these surgeries are difficult, and sometimes the surgeries have. Uh, um, have uh, some complications, but sometimes these patients can still do very well. Uh, I mean, even if you think, oh, no, this patient doesn't have been. So she is 20-25 in that eye. So. so this is a patient who I also saw uh, in about four months of age, and they presented to my clinic. And, uh, uh, and you know, typically in America, when, we, when uh, infants are born, they do some basic tests. They test the urine. And what was found in this patient was uh, 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 this patient came back that nothing was wrong with the patient, but then we saw this finding in both uh, in both eyes. So we sent uh, some uh, we sent the urine, and this patient was found to have uh, galactosemia. And so this is the oil drop cataract for galactosemia, and uh, uh, it's uh, you know uh, so she we had this patient ended up having surgery, um, uh, but uh, she also had to get her disease treated as well. And that's kind of the primary thing we want to take care of these patients medical problems as well as the vision problems. Um, here's another interesting patient. So this patient I saw, he's a 12-year-old, 12-year-old boy. I've had three patients like this, but this patient is particularly, uh, I particularly remember them well. This patient is a 12-year-old boy, and uh, he had a history of a stem cell transplant, and then he was given uh, uh, steroid, he was given steroid treatment afterwards, and so he developed PSC cataract. So I was like, oh, we're doing cataract. This, his vision went from 2025 to 2026. I was like, oh, we're doing cataract surgery. I'm super excited. You know, I got a patient to do surgery on. 
Uh, but then we got the IOL calculations, and then the IOL calculations showed, showed some astigmatism. And they're like, oh, let's, let's look at the astigmatism. And so then we looked at the astigmatism, and we found that this patient actually had keratoconus. And he had change in vision only in the last six months. So then we're like, well, before you do the surgery, let's try to treat the treat the keratoconus. So we, we gave a RGP, and his vision went from 2060 to 2025. So these PSC cataracts and in infants, they are deceptive. I see patients who look like the, especially in this group of uh, kids who had stem cell transplant, I see patients who look like they can't see through the PSC cataract. As you see in adults, there's many adults who have PSC cataracts, and their visual acuity is good. The thing that they're complaining of is glare. They complain of glare when they're driving, but their visual acuity is oftentimes pretty good. And so actually his visual vision acuity, uh, visual acuity was uh, was good after the correction, so we loved him, and we're gonna follow him for certain minutes. He doesn't drive, I'm sure when he's 16 or 17, he'll get the cataract surgery, but at this point, you still have accommodation, and you want to leave accommodation with these kids as long as possible um, uh, to help them, you know, in their in their life. And so the cataract's not bothering them, you know, just the. So now we move into unilateral cataracts. Unilateral cataracts are very simple. I mean, uh, basically, due to the trauma, uh, it's, or it could be pers persistent fetal vascular disorder. It could be an uh, idiopathic one, and then also there's patients who have prior uh, ROP treatment uh, who had uh, some. VR surgery or any type of even laser surgery, these patients oftentimes will develop cataracts. Uh, so, uh, so the non-surgical. So, as I mentioned, I have a lot of patients who are following with uh, not we follow we don't perform surgery on, and uh, so we'll do these in patients where they have incomplete cataracts. Uh, we'll do them when uh, uh, there's a low density, a low density cataract uh, that's paracentral. Um, if one eye is different than the other, we'll try patching the, the good eye to see if the other eye improves. If it doesn't, then it's like, hey, this patient failed and needs surgery. Um, sometimes you can do the dilating drops, but this is kind of risky because once again, when you do the dilating drops, you're cutting out the, uh, you're cutting out the accommodation. And when you cut out the accommodation, they're going to suffer in the near work, and then the, that eye will develop, is possibly going to develop the amniopia. Um, so surgical management, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we try to do surgery between four and six weeks We're balancing the glaucoma uh, from early surgery versus the amblyopia uh, from waiting too long. Um, uh, we typically, in UCLA, what uh, Hassan and I kind of saw up there was we're patients were getting, we're getting consent, we're doing an exam under anesthesia, a full exam, we're doing an ultrasound, getting axial length. Uh, we're doing idle well biometry, and then we're doing a con contact lens fitting of both eyes uh, with the cornea with the with the optometrist who specializes that they come for the procedure when the patient's under anesthesia to get the good measurement so that we don't do it when the patient's awake in clinic later. So we kind of make this a multidisciplinary approach, and very well organized, very well structured, and we, we take it out. So this paper, although it's old, it's from 2001. Uh, it's this is a great paper. And uh, this is a this is a, a, a paper from uh, uh, from uh, David Taylor uh, from uh, Taylor and Boyd's Ophthalmology, and then Kenneth Wright is a guy based out of LA. He's very popular. He also has his own textbook. So both these guys are the two textbook writers of pediatric ophthalmology, and uh, they, they talk about you know patients that you consider to operate and the patients you consider to observe. And see, you can see here. So there's a lot of patients you can. But any of these things over here, uh, I, I would I highly consider you know operating on those patients. Yeah, uh, but excuse me, the last one. The uh, last confluent. So like say the, the cataract. So like the PSC cataracts, they're not they're little speckles, right? The confluent ones are like the posterior polar cataract where it's a cons a consistent blockage throughout the lens. So that's what he's described. So if it's confluent, probably has to go. Probably has to go. Uh, so Kenneth Wright uh, is so he's what they do in this paper is they compare the uh, California view versus the versus the British view and um, Kenneth Wright kind of speaks for the California view. He did, he's not one of mine and uh, Hassan's attending, but he, he he's local and uh, but he kind of does exactly what we do. He will operate as early as possible for a unilateral cataract. Uh, we'll try to take a unilateral cataract out as soon as he can. He sometimes will even go to the point where it's too early. We'll wait until four weeks, but he'll sometimes go too early because he's very concerned of amniopia. And he's had very good results. I mean, he does them within like the first two weeks of life, and uh, his, he's pro uh, reporting stereo acuities of uh, 50 yards of uh, stereo acuity. So, I mean, he has had some very good results. Um, 
And then the British, the British view is a little bit more. And also the main thing he recommends in his paper, I have to mention as well, is he does not put an eye on the land for these unilateral cataracts. He does contact lens until uh, 18 or 17 or 18, and then afterwards uh, he will do an eye well insertion. And the same thing for the lady I showed you earlier. She also was a faking until 18 or 19. She's doing contact lens fitting, and then after the contact lens fitting, um, we did a uh, we she, she got an eye well insertion, uh, a suture eye well insertion when she was I think like 21, and uh, she she did very well. I, and so I, I I really don't think there's a rush uh, to. Put in, I don't really don't think there's a rush to put in an IOL these patients. The British people in this paper in 2001, this precedes uh, infinite AKA treatment study, so they were putting in the IOLs in the younger patients. And you know, obviously, it's it's to some degree guesswork when you're doing it in the first few weeks of life. And so this came out uh, 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 nine years out of the paper, but that really what the Californians were doing nine years prior was still what infinite AKA treatment study uh, suggested, uh, which is that. You know, this kind of compares, hey, should we do, should for unilateral cataract, should we put, should we put a lens in, or should we do contact lens fitting? And this study kind of shows conclusively that it's better to just put the, it's better just to do contact lens fitting and just do the secondary eye well insertion at a later time. Um, because these patients do very well. The only the only caveat to this is if a patient is an uh, unreliable family, you don't know if you're ever gonna see them again, and they're never gonna do the contact lens fitting, then you can consider, hey, you know, this patient we probably just need to roll the dice and put the uh, put the IOL in it. So you, I never jump. So patients would come in and they'd be congenital cataract patients, with, and I'd be following them, and they would have an IOL in, and it would be was done in see. And two times I was like, oh, why did they do this? You know, the IETDS said this, da da da. But then I realized I never saw that patient again, and that's because they did they did it and they did the right thing because that patient had decent vision. So, so generally speaking, what is the percentage of unreliable families? We have very few. Yeah, so in America, so we're, we're in UCLA, the, uh, the, the, there's a large immigrant population uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Mexican immigrant population. When do you change the contact lens? So we, we get that we follow these patients at least every three or four months. And so then, but then we don't end up changing the contact lens except for maybe every year or so. Every year, maybe even longer. So uh, no, it's it's it, it's it, it's some it's a uh, hard contact lens. Hard Yeah. For the infinity. For the infinity. Yes. Actually, the problem with our setup is that contact lens lens are not available. I see. So here, technically, most children will go for the infinity class. If you do not implant, you need to offer lens. I see. So here, the choice is whether you have a drop lens or have a taking glasses because there is no one who prescribes the contact lens in the place most of it for contact lens. I see. So I this see. is the problem we have. I see, I see, I see. And similarly, as you show in the technology, the infections were at the bottom of the list. Huh? But here, unfortunately, the infections were at the top of the list. Oh, wow. So rubella and cause yeah, so in this case where you're competing, by, so that changes the study. I wasn't sure of the contact lens uh, status in Pakistan. But if this is the case, that doing an IOL, in that case, doing an IOL is not as bad of an idea. Uh, it might even be probably the best way to go uh, over here, even in a younger age. Uh, the, the thing that you want to avoid is though sometimes these patients have a big, they, they end up developing like degenerative myopia, and so sometimes they, they require a secondary IOL, an IOL exchange afterwards, and so these kinds of surgeries end up being very difficult. And so, um, uh, but, I, but like I said, if this is the, in the best interest of the patient, which I'm, it sounds like it is in Pakistan, then that's definitely the way to go. Um, so this is a, this is a, actually isn't even out yet. Uh, this is a, a, the manuscript's been accepted for this study, but it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not been uh, published yet. Uh, so this is by the same group, the IATS group, um, and uh, basically what they say in this study is uh, they're looking at. So this was zero to six months was uh, infinite AK treatment study. This is seven to twenty four months, and in seven to twenty four months they showed that these patients. Uh, they did pretty well, uh, and there's really the the intraoperative complications of placing an IOL dropped uh, significantly.
significantly. So um, in America, the common practice was to wait until two to do an eye level insertion, but this study I think will change the practice to where we're doing eye level insertions as early as seven months, eight months old. Um, and um, so yeah, so this is kind of moving more towards uh, being a little bit more aggressive with the eye level insertion. And uh, like I said, even in the infinite APK treatment study, it, it was it showed that there was some intraoperative complications, but it wasn't a lot. It wasn't like this is completely wrong to do the uh, eye level. They were just saying, oh, it's probably a little bit safer to just do the contact. I think there it definitely is no, definitely, it might even be the right thing to do in the 7 to 20, it's, it is the right thing to do in the 7 to 24 months old. And before that, I definitely don't think it's uh, the wrong thing to do. Um, so this kind of, uh, you know, you can look at the age of surgery. This kind of compares the IATS to the uh, TAPS, and uh, you can see that um, uh, the adverse events in the TAPS, well, I mean, 46 of 81 uh, to 12 uh, of 24, statistically significant uh, drop in Complications uh, with a key value less than uh, uh, 0 0.001. So, um, so yeah, not a bad idea. Definitely except for 24 months old. I personally wait for 12 months old, but that's just. But we have a different contact possibility. Uh, so, you know, how do you? Which eye level are you going to put in the eye? So, uh, this is a this is a uh, 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 from the American Academy of Ophthalmology website. Uh, this is very good uh, in the in the UCLA. Uh, a minus on the tenure used to kind of tell us that you want to do seven minus the age of the patient, and that's what your hyperopic aim is. So if it was like a if it was like a three year old, you would do seven minus three, so you'd be aiming for a plus four. So you look over there, like around there, the four to four nine, that's a plus four die off the one. So so that's how you decide. Uh, you know, you're undercorrecting these patients because you're predicting that eye is going to grow in length to where the hyperopia where the hyper Um, so, you know, this is surgical management. It's the same thing for you all. We do the same thing, same little fitting. And we do the contact lens fitting from here um, because obviously you develop the steering view with the near vision. Um, so, here is a surgical video. Uh, let's see this one. Here we go. So, this is uh, from mine and uh, uh, Hassan's uh, uh, program uh, in. Uh, and UCLA, we were there. Um, this is a, uh, we, we, we do two staff incisions. Um, uh, we do a very controlled uh, capsule rexus with the uh, uh, grasping forceps. So that's kind of finishing the capsule rexus. So we will try to do as small incisions as possible. Uh, we do some visceral losses. Look, this is a more posterior cataract. So uh, we do a visceral elastic. I moved away from doing hydrodissection, I do more hydrodelineation. Very easy to get the lens out. If you do adult cataracts, it's getting the lens out isn't the hard part. So you can just do IA, if you did good hydrodelineation or hydrodissection, kind of just comes straight to you. This is like a bimanual approach. This patient is uh, four months old. So then uh, afterwards we tend to do, uh, for patients who are under the age of five, uh, we'll do a, uh, we'll do a, uh, so we, we're filling the lens, we're filling in over here. Sorry, this patient is actually eight months old. So, um, uh, so we're, we're filling the bag with this elastic. We're planning to do a posterior, uh, uh, this is a posterior lens cut as the one I mentioned we're going to be doing. And uh, we do a posterior capsule axis. And we remove the blockage. If you're doing this in an older patient, in a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, uh, and they have a type of, I've, I've had patients like this, I don't do this, I don't do this part. I just leave it and I just yag them. I do the yag laser and within a few weeks after. Um, so here, uh, those are got boys performed in the same technique with the retina graph and forceps. Aimed a little bit smaller, uh, using micro scissors to help kind of cut some uh, sticky parts. So then, this patient, this patient was actually a little bit older. We decided to place an IOL, and so uh, what we do is we place visco elastic. Uh, there is no posterior capsule, but we place visco elastic into the remnant uh, of the bag, and we kind of widen the intracapsular space. Uh, 
Uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we, we have been doing these, this surgery through, uh, through small, uh, port decisions, but now we make the big decision for placing the, for placing the, uh, uh break the side off, and we're placing this into the back. You don't have to place this in the back. You can also place this, uh, you can place this into the sulcus, uh, if you want the sulcus space, but then you need to kind of, uh, modify your ILL calculation, uh, minus one, uh, uh, minus two. Because you're moving the lens forward. And, uh, then you see the kind of slide right in there. So, uh, uh, some people actually will then push the lens in and they will do, uh, they will button the lens, so they'll capture the lens in behind the posterior back. Up, so, so but we, uh, we don't do that, we didn't do that too late, but some of the anterior segment specialists who don't do regular PDF, who are just really good at cataract surgery, they'll do that, and they have very good results. That's it. Good work, Dave. Thank you. Uh, so this is kind of, uh, this is kind of disputed, um, but, uh, we, have, we also insert, uh, we do a high, when we do a suture, suture. Um, so basically, um, it depends, but usually before the age of, like, four or five, we're spending, we'll, it's always on the table. Especially in this kind of case, um, where the patient is, uh, where the patient, we're going to do a posterior capsulotomy anyways, then it's definitely on the table. Uh, but, the five-year-olds, four and five-year-olds I did most recently, I did do it, and I don't think I had any, no, no bad, no, no bad reason that I, nothing bad happened. The, uh, and anyone who's after the age of six, I mean, you'll be surprised. I did a, I did a YAG on a six-year-old last week, and so why go back there if you don't have to? I did the YAG on her, she did very well, and her lens is good. Her vision went from 2060 to 2030 after the YAG, and so, um, you know, from my personal experience, uh, yeah, in the older patients, I mean, even above the age of three or four, I'm considering to not do it. And so that's that. So that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, you know, it, it's tougher. So as I said, I did a yak on a five-year-old recently. And that's tougher to stuff to get them to stay still and stuff like that. But if you have, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, uh, so that's kind of the deciding point. Is it's all, we're doing the we're doing the anterior vitrectomy for patients who uh, who we have to do a posterior capsulotomy. And if you're doing the posterior capsulotomy from ages zero to four, zero to five, you're going to be doing it because you don't think these patients can sit for laser. And in the, in the, Hassan was with me. There were several patients. We have an anterior segment surgeon who was from England. And he was very, uh, very sorry trained in Warfields, and um, he's now in uh, present UCLA. And he wanted to do. Uh, he wanted to do posterior capsulotomies always. But one time I told him, like, you know what, let's let's not do it for this case. And uh, and we did it, and then the, the patient developed a posterior uh, posterior uh, capsule uh, opacification. So what we did was we brought the patient back and we just yagged them. We brought the yag laser down into the anesthesia room and they were I think one and a half. Just got it off and it was done. We didn't have to go in the eye. It was like the best surgery ever because the patient just woke up and you know they, they, they were doing very well. So even in those cases, I don't know if that's practical over here to get the gag laser down to the to the operating room. But um, you know, you don't have to go back there because a lot of these intraoperative complications you're seeing in the IATS study and all these things, it comes from the vitreous. That vitreous, once you start putting water in the vitreous, it starts to kind of get bigger, expand, and it can close the angle. I think this has to do something. This is some possible problem. So I try. If I don't have to go back there, I'm really trying not to. Yeah,
there is risk with doing this for the patients and uh, under See, the article which I studied was that you hit the position in the different position uh -huh. and you remove the chin rest of the ear I see. So that the ear can be brought closer to the patient. I see. And then you can hear it. That's very good. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's good. done so far and we are not doing it and I said okay give me one patient I'll do and we will see because I'm here for the one year yeah. and we will see the post results and uh, it was so good, so good. Uh, that they started doing it uh, and then I think the paper come up afterwards yeah, yeah. this is this is what same exact experience so the Warfields guy now in, in New Zealand he only does it and he said oh we did do this so he was trained at the Warfields the sick kids they didn't do this in either place this YAG approach on these younger children uh, but after that, he said, I will always do it this way. Because uh, he was planning to do a, do a limbal, post, he was trying to do a parse plane approach and remove the capsule on this patient. And this is, I mean, no reason to go back there unless you absolutely have to. The patient has a one. So I just, I'm fully for doing gags. <coughs> I try to, if they're around four or five, even before we take the anesthesia, I try to see if I can do it in the room, in the, in the room. Because really, if you're going around and you're not, you're not going to pit the lens. If you're sitting around the periphery, if you pit the lens, you're going to pit it in a, in a position that doesn't really matter. And so so I tried to even, so this five-year-old I just did while she was awake. And she just sat there. She was a really good kid, um, but, but she, she did it. And so uh, and, and, in UCLA, we were doing six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds all the time. And very easy. And tending weren't even coming with us anymore. Um, but here's some other use of complications. Uh, we didn't talk much about glaucoma, uh, infected glaucoma, post-operative uveitis. Uh, endophthalmitis isn't very common. Um, retinal uh, detachment, that does happen sometimes. Uh, I think this is kind of not mentioned much in papers, but the early postoperative complications in these cases are actually pretty common. And um, so, you know, always be looking for wound leak. Do a full exam on these patients on post-op day one, post-op uh, week one, post-op one month, uh, and make sure these things aren't going on. Because sometimes you think, oh, this patient has the infinity of glaucoma, but really there's just vitreous there. And you just got to get rid of the vitreous and take them back to the operating these patients to do well, as I mentioned with the previous patient. And CME doesn't happen very often in uh, these children. Uh, so post-operative fault, as I mentioned, this is the key. And so this is the patient, you, you, if you don't know these patients very well, we're not doing a good job. You should know these patients, because you should be seeing these patients all the time um, as they grow up. Because once you do the surgery, the surgery, I think, is the easy part, to follow these kids and make sure their vision is optimized. That's the hard part. Um, it takes a lot. It's very meticulous work. And uh, so you're seeing these patients. Um, do you know visual acuity, IOP check, check the posterior capsule if you left it, make sure it's uh, it's it's still patent. Uh, compare the previous visual acuities, make sure there's no changes, and if there are, consider patching. And we use the near contact lenses and um, uh, just to make sure they're seeing near to develop stereo acuity. And then for distance, they have uh, they have uh, over the top uh, glasses. Um, so uh, I talked to Hassan, Hassan wanted me to also talk about, you know, asked me to talk a little bit about glaucoma, drainage devices, and the treatment of pediatric patients. Um, so, so as you guys know, like the mainstay of treatment for pediatric glaucoma is goniotomy. Goniotomy is what we're doing again and again and again. Goniotomy works very well in primary and general glaucoma. And um, uh, so, you know, success rate is as high as 90%. Um, when the cornea is cloudy, we then trabeculotomy is a very common procedure we do. Um, and so that also works very well. And that's actually um, uh, also a similar, su similar success rate. Um, so um, when a patient has a secondary glaucoma, though, these procedures don't work as well. And uh, any type of glaucoma that's not primary to dental glaucoma, and annual surgery is not doing the job. Uh, so, you know, typically what used to happen in the 80s and the 90s uh, in America is people would then do 
to, uh, they, they have three options, you know, filtering, surgery, and cycle destruction. For whatever reason, they weren't doing drainage implants for these kids. Uh, so what they would do is uh, they would do filtering surgery, uh, but, you know, the success rate of filtering surgery was okay. Uh, but the problem with that is, is if these patients are glaucoma patients for life. And you, if, the, if the conjunctive is scarred in one area, this patient can't get a tube in that area in the future. And so you, so you really have to kind of think, you know, if, if, if I knew that uh, tuberculectomy was the same, had the same outcome as, uh, as uh, a glaucoma drainage device, you really can kind of, you can always remove a glaucoma drainage device and you're not really going to damage the conjunctive. Um, also, the uh, NNC and the 5-FU lead to uh, some problems in the blood. And then if the patient doesn't have a, um, uh, if the patient, uh, if you don't do MMC or 5 FU, then the patient scars very, very easily. And uh, the blood never even forms and then the conductor does the scar. So it's kind of, you know, a juggling act when you do too much blood. Not saying it doesn't work, it does work, but uh, it, it, it's, it might, not, might not be the absolute best. And in psychodestructive procedures, these procedures are done now judiciously in America, um, but, uh, you know, you're always worried about tysis. Um, with these patients, uh, anything can go wrong. These patients, you can basically, uh, hypotony and tysis happen very commonly. I've seen patients who walk in with hypotony and they have choroidal effusions and, you know, from someone doing an uh, 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 ECP on them and, um, and these patients are in their 20s. And so obviously this is way more prone to happen in the younger kids. So you just, if you do an ECP, you know, people usually do half an eye. I, I would even do an eighth of an eye or a quarter of an eye. But if the pressure's high, you should do something. Um, so, we, you know, the first uh, description of doing this was Volcano did this in 1973, um, and he had a success rate of 67%. Um, and then afterwards, people uh, started uh, uh, using them uh, as a backup after conventional medical treatment. You're doing all the drops, you're doing all the surgery, nothing's working. But this is kind of a backup. Uh, so, you know, um, Sharon Friedman is at Duke University. She's very uh, well known. A glaucoma specialist. Uh, this is a paper of hers from the 90s, and uh, she kind of talks about these patients all had cyclodestructive procedures, several surgeries, several surgeries before, and then she did the two. Okay, and her outcomes. I mean, if you look at these uh, these uh, slides over here, uh, this figure over here, you can see that uh, as the months go by, the pressure just drops from 30 to around 12, and then it just kind of stays around there. And if they didn't have the cyclodestructive procedure, they kind of come back a little bit. It comes back a little bit higher, um, and, but they still, the pressure drops, and so I mean it, it works very well. Obviously, there are risks to complications, um, and so these are the patients that failed. I think there's like 13 <coughs> eyes in this, and so this. So one of them I think doesn't even count. It was a, a, a patient who had a ciliary body and a new epithelioma. I think it was misdiagnosis in the and the nitrate. They died. That makes doesn't count. So we should remove that item even in the study. Uh, in our minds. But these two patients, uh, these, these patients, they're probably a failure, but for 17 months the pressure was with less than uh, 21, and then eventually the pressure kind of rose. So I don't know if they consider that a failure. Um, for the fake glaucoma, this is the one patient where there was problems. And this patient uh, failed in 24 months and uh, required uh, had a retinal detachment and progressed to NLP. Um, with the very common complications of these patients, you're going to see problems with the tube, the iris is going to go in the tube. The tube's going to touch the cornea. All these things can happen with the tube and the, and the eye. And so these are the things that can go wrong. But these are things that most, a lot of times, these can be fixed. A lot of times, if you do a second surgery and just kind of move things around, uh, if you pull the iris out, you know, just do what you need to do with some visible elastic and things happen. Um, so this is taken from 2006. And this is looking at very well glaucoma implants and PNH patients. And these patients oftentimes did not get, these are, they're using it more, so after the year 15 years past, or sorry, seven years past from that first study to this study. And what you can tell is, she suggested that in that study, she was like, you know, what I noticed was if a patient did have a, a ECP done, if they didn't have cyclo, uh, uh, they didn't have that procedure done, what she noticed was that um, uh, the patient's pressure still was high with the azimuth. So she was like, maybe in these patients we should use a bare belt and get, because uh, these have a larger plate, and then we can get a higher uh, pressure drop, a more uh, meaningful pressure drop. And so she starts, she kind of suggests that in the paper. And so in this study, some of these patients had uh, uh, ECP done, but uh, some of them didn't. And you'll see that the results, again, were uh, pretty good. Um, there are only failures for these patients, but these patients failed after several years, or like several months of passing, then there would be a failure. Uh, 
Um, so I think this is a good slide right here. Uh, table three uh, kind of shows, uh, you know, the so the pressure. You can see the uh, look at the number of eyes and look at the pressure drop. Uh, the mean pressure uh, pre-operative is 27, and then over the course, the pressure slowly kind of rises back from 10 to 18. And so, but it still is controlling the pressure. And it, obviously, even when you do these on adults, after like several years pass, you'll see that the pressure begins to rise. Uh, or a year or so pass, you'll see the pressure begins to rise back. And usually, you also know a, a high phase of pressure right after the insertion when you do these in adults. But in kids, there really is no high phase. You'll see on post-op, uh, uh, like right away, they're low. And, uh, and so, nothing to do with um, So these are the patients that have failures. You'll see a lot of these patients have previous surgery. And, um, uh, and so, but these are, you look at the time of failure, most of these patients are failing at 50 months, 45 months, 25 months. So this is two years where you're having pressure control. So it's not really a failure, uh, it's just, it's not, a, it's, it's, it's not lasting as long as you would have liked. Um, Hypotony would be the risk that I think everyone would be concerned in their mind. And this is three patients out of 50 some eyes who have the hypotony. And often these are patients who were done, who were, who probably could have had a domiotomy or something else done, you know, uh, or some other type of procedure done, and they kind of jump straight to this. So would, would I say this is the first procedure you do for a patient with pediatric glaucoma? I don't think so. Uh, you should try something else first, but it is something to definitely keep in mind. And here's what I was talking to you guys about, you know, the iris can jump into the tube, all sorts of things can happen in these patients, uh, uh, you know, with the tube being in the in, uh, anterior chamber. And uh, uh, so, you know, we're talking about who's, now what are the current recommendations? So this is from uh, 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 Taylor Hoyt's book. Uh, Scott Lambert is in the Bay Area. He practices near me. And this is kind of what he does now. He's kind of like the anterior segment guy in California. And he, he'll, he, he considers uh, doing a tube as a primary surgery on patients who have a vacant glaucoma. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that, because sometimes we'll see you'll, two of this patient have hypotony, maybe you should try something else. So, I mean, maybe it should be the primary, but it can be. But patient water uh, with severely diseased patients who are going to need several trips of water, you want something that works right away, so these patients are something uh, you know, to consider. So, on, in the accumulation of all studies, there's an 80% success in two years, and that kind of correlates with the two studies I showed you. But it drops to 50% later, and that kind of also correlates that people, are, as the time passes, slowly uh, the tube stop working. But at that point, you have other options. You can remove the tube, you can do something else, you can you can place a second tube. So she had, uh, the, uh, Dr. Freeman, who I mentioned earlier, she has several patients who she put two tubes in at the same time. And so, um, and she's had, she's, she's said the cases to report something, and they're pretty good. Uh, uh, so, uh, so and then, uh, as I last I mentioned, the bear belt is better at controlling pressure, uh, but it has a, a higher rate of complications, and it has a larger plate on it, so uh, it does uh, pretty well. And this is kind of the last thing video of this. So I think it's part of the reason why I was discouraged off of that is because you were trying to cause true business, but now there's, there's some like, small place, and so you put the one the small place back there um, and not really be getting the muscles uh, in, in a pediatric guy. You gotta go way back in between um, finding the valve
most of you are going to have the bone. Because you know why? Because there's a lower risk of hypotenuse. I think everyone's always trying to head the best. You don't want to have a complication of that. I don't know about the lower plane, but I think most of the time everyone's going to. The bare bone, this is actually a paper from Europe, and I think they're a little bit more uh, aggressive um, with this. Once you get those two in, you're good.